Do you have old suspended floors in your house? Maybe contemplating getting a heat pump, need to install underfloor heating? Watch on to find out how I converted a suspended floor into a solid, well-insulated floor with underfloor heating. This project started out with the plan to lift the floorboards, put solid PIR insulation in between the joists and install underfloor heating, either with heat spreader plates sitting on top of the joists or preferably with the heating pipes down on top of the PIR insulation and then a screed on top to act as a heat sink to store the heat and help it be better distributed into the room. As you can see from the solid screeded floor I'm standing on, none of that worked out. On lifting the floorboards, it turned out there were several joists that had a serious amount of decay. At some point in the past, someone had patched the floor with some new joists in between the dodgy rotten ones. The end result was a patchwork mess. Fixing it would have meant removing the whole floor and putting in a brand new suspended floor with new joists. Another nail in the coffin of the idea of a suspended floor was airflow. Our plans for the house involve a modern extension at the front and the back of the house. That would be where this window is and on the other side of this wall. But both of these walls had underfloor vents and the extensions would leave exposed vents only on this one external wall here. And that's not good for airflow and would probably have resulted in the new floor quickly rotting in the resulting damp conditions under the floor. All these problems combined with the fact that the cavity turned out to only be 30 centimeters deep convinced me that converting to an insulated solid floor was a good move. Being a retrofit project, I ended up with a slightly unorthodox floor buildup. Under the existing floor, it turned out there was already a fairly robust concrete slab, about 10 centimeters thick. With 10 centimeter thick PIR insulation and a screed of about seven centimeters, that left me with about 13 centimeters to fill. As I was doing the floor, I took the opportunity to remove the existing chimney that was unused. This has left me with lots of bricks and rubble that I decided to use to fill that 13 centimeter gap. On top of that, I'm applying a bed of sharp sand to create a stable flat base for the insulation. using a brush at the moment to spread the sand out, try and make sure it gets down in between all the little gaps. Fill it in as much as possible. Doesn't hurt when I'm walking over it as well. Now that the sand is in and reasonably level, I'm going to use a whacker plate to compact everything down and create a stable base. So this is definitely a stupid idea. That said, taking precautions, I have a fairly decent mask, probably doesn't provide any protection. And all the windows are open, including the front door. There's a nice breeze going through here. I'm not going to run it for too long. Um, yeah, don't run a petrol engine inside, it's stupid. Now that I've survived that without giving myself carbon monoxide poisoning, I'm going to get in a bit more sand, just spread it around, try and even out some of the dips, 
make sure it's up to the level that I've marked on the wall. I'll maybe just tap that down lightly with the rake. So now the sand's down, um, it's reasonably flat, compact. I don't think it has to be perfect because the insulation is going to sit on top of it and then there's the screen on top of that. Uh, it's the screen that you want to make sure it's level, so have got a nice flat floor. Um, next job is to get a DPM down on top of the sand. And then hopefully get some insulation in. Let's get cracking, I bet this is going to be fiddly. We get a couple boards of insulation down, it'll help hold it in place and just so I can see where the level is there. The DPM wasn't quite large enough for the awkward shape, so I'm adding a small additional section and taping with special DPM tape. So this specific one, it's very strong and very sticky, is Mammoth Tape for Mammoth Tasks, apparently, from Everbuild. So I made a rookie YouTuber mistake at this point and lost the footage of the rest of the insulation going down and the foil tape going on the joists. I've also put in a roll of edge insulation around the edge here to provide a tiny amount of insulation, but more importantly to give the screed somewhere to go when it expands and contracts. The next job is to lay the underfloor heating pipes on top of the insulation. For this I'm using 16mm PEX Al laid at 15cm centres with the colder temperatures the heat pumps work at, this is the recommended spacing to get the most amount of heat out of the floor. Fix the pipes to the insulation. I'm using a combination of pipe clip rails, like this, and 16 millimeter staples. I'd never used Pexel before and it turned out to be a real pain to work with. The rails were useful to maintain the spacing but were almost useless at holding the pipe down onto the ground. The staples were a godsend for this. You stuff them down into the insulation and they really stick in place. I thought about investing in one of the staplers that you can use, but they're ridiculously expensive for what they do. And in a small floor like this, pushing the staples in by hand was easy enough. Upstairs, I've previously used 15mm JG Speedfit lay flat, which is really easy to work with. In contrast, this PEX Al was a lot more rigid than I'd imagined. It really holds its shape, so when it comes off the coil, Unlike the lay flat that you have to sort of encourage to go straight, this you can bend and it stays how you bend it. So you can bend it into whatever shape you want. And unlike the normal PEX pipe, it keeps the shape that you put it into. It's so rigid because as well as the usual two layers of polyethylene, the PEX Al contains a thin layer of aluminium. It's a real pain to work with, but on the plus side, it was half the price of the JG lay flat. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I'd really love if you could let me know by mashing the like button. But now that I've got all of the pipework down on the insulation, the next job before I can screed the floor is to fill the pipework with water, get out all the air, and then pressure test the system and leave the pipework pressurized while we screed the floor. So the underfloor heating pipe is 16 mil, but 
tails that come from the manifold and all the rest of the pipework in the house is 15 mil. I'm going to attempt to use a 16 to 16 mil coupler to connect the 15 mil pipework to the 16 mil pipework. So this is a 15 mil pipe and I use this to open it up a tiny bit and chamfer the end and it seems to fit nice and snug onto the 16 mil coupler. Um, it takes a little bit of effort to get it in there, but I think that will probably hold it firm. You can get a 16 to 15 coupler, but they're ridiculously expensive. I think this was like three pounds and the 16 to 15 is like 10 or 12 pounds, something like that. I think this will do the job and the pressure test will prove that it works. We'll soon find out if it doesn't. So I'm going to connect up one end of the pipe to the hose from outside and the other end into a bucket and we'll run some water through it and get all the air out. Then we can cap off one end and connect the other end up to the Rothenberger pressure tester. So let's crack on and do that. Exciting bit, let's get some water in. We've got some water. While we've got this connected up, let's put some water in the pressure tester. It's a bit precarious on there, but let's live life dangerously. So now the pipe work is full of water and all the bubbles are out. I'm going to disconnect the hose, put a stop end on that end and use the pressure tester on this end to put some pressure into the pipework and let's make sure there's no leaks anywhere. So far so good, but no pressure. So now that the pipework is full of water, capped off on one end, connected to the pressure tester on the other end, we've got some water in the pressure tester. We're going to put some pressure in this up to six bar, leave it for 10, 15 minutes. If it's dropped, we'll put a little bit more in and then leave it for about an hour to test the pressure. If everything's fine and it stays at about six bar, then we know that the pipework is good and there are no leaks. So once that's done, I'm going to leave the pipework pressurized by closing this valve here, disconnect the pressure tester, and we can crack on and screw the floor. slightly overshot six bar. I'm going to let out a little bit of pressure to bring it down to 100 psi just because it's a nice big easy number to see. There we go. So currently at seven bar or exactly 100 psi. So I'm going to leave that for a little bit and see how it goes. So it's been about six hours since I first put pressure into here. Pressure tester is still connected and is reading 100 psi, hasn't moved at all. So I'm going to switch off that valve, disconnect the pressure tester and leave all the pipework pressurized while I screed the floor. So today's day I'm going to finally screed the floor. I've actually had the heating system down for about a week now. It's full of water, it's pressurized. Today I'm going to try and get in about 70 millimeters of screed. I've marked around the edges here where the level should be. So I'm mixing up screed for the floor myself. Um, don't know if that's smart or not, probably not. Could have had a big batch of screed delivered and then just borrowed it in. This doesn't seem like it'll be too bad. So we've got four parts sharp sand to one part cement. So I'm just using the bucket, filling the bucket twice with sand and then half a bucket of cement, fixing it up in there, making sure not to put too much water in because it'd be a nightmare to work with if it was all soggy. So 
let's mix up a batch. Could probably just shovel it straight in, but this is only a tiny bit more work and will give me slightly more accurate mix, I guess. I don't trust myself to get it right, just shoveling it in like a pro builder would. Don't breeze. This sand used to be really wet, but it has actually dried out quite a lot. So, being the first time I've ever mixed screed, no idea if this is right or not, but kind of mixing it up so that when you grab a handful, it just holds together. and looking to make sure there are not too many little balls of cement and sand rolling around at the edge. level that I want the screed to sit at all around the edges here so I'm starting out by placing the screed at the edges then I'll compact that down use a spirit level make sure it's flat and level and then use that to start screeding and leveling the rest of the floor being careful to try and not put the shovel through any of the underfloor heating pipes, because that would suck. screed turned out to be a lot more work than I'd imagined. I wasn't expecting it to be easy, but mixing the screed in the mixer and barrowing it into the house, then moving it around the room and leveling it all was really slow going. I started mixing screed about midday and finished off about 10pm. That did include a short break to grab some dinner and once I was done screeding I then still had to go and clean up and clean the mixer. I was so focused on making sure that my screen wasn't too wet that my first couple of batches were too dry. The end result is some of the edges of the laid screed are in a few places a little crumbly and I will probably need to patch some of it up before laying the final floor cover. If I was doing this again, I'd make a point of starting earlier. A bit ironically, I started late as I went out to get more cement that I thought I needed. But as it turned out, my calculations were wrong and I was left with six bags of cement extra. Anyway, better to have too much than not enough. For a first attempt at screeding a floor, I think it's gone okay. Now I have to wait about a month for the screed to dry before I can look at putting down a final floor covering. If you're still with me at this point, I hope you found something helpful in this video. It would be amazing if you could take a second to mash that subscribe button. It really helps motivate me to continue putting in the effort to film and produce these videos. It will also encourage YouTube to show you new videos on the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.